from the book. The irony is that as America equalizes the environmental circumstances of people's lives, the remaining differences in intelligence are increasingly determined by difference in, difference, differences in genes. Putting it all together, success and failure in the American economy and all that goes with it are increasingly a matter of the genes that people inherit. Um, now, they did have science to back this argument up. I strongly <laughs> dispute that science, um, but I don't view these guys as racist, actually. I think they were, they were arguing what they thought science was telling them. Uh, and it's a pretty depressing message when you think about it. Uh, you don't even have to think about it. It's right there. Uh, only some of us are capable of, of extraordinary success. Um, well, I spent the last several years researching for a book um, that was just mentioned uh, about the science of human potential. And I'm going to spend the next uh, 14 or 15 minutes explaining why I think that these <laughs> these authors of the bell curve actually got it dead wrong. So we're going to start with a story about rats from 1958. <laughs> you've, got your, you've got your rat dopes. I didn't think this was a funny slide when I made it. <laughs> Wait till you see the cat. You think this is funny. Uh, you've got your rat dopes and your rat Einsteins. These are two different breeds uh, of rat that were that were actually genetically partitioned, just as the bell curve authors warned people would uh, eventually be. Uh, they're genetically partitioned for intelligence. So over, over several generations, these, uh, these rats, these two different breeds, were raised for two different kinds of intelligence. And this is the uh, running of the maze that uh, shows how reliable this was. This is after many generations. They ran these, um, they ran these, um, two different breeds through a, a maze, and the rat dopes, actually, is it not showing up? Oh, maze error. So you can see the rat dopes are making many more maze errors than the rat Einstein. So what these researchers did um, at the University of Manitoba in 1958, they took these same two groups, and they wanted to see how environment affected the, uh, the outcome. So they raised new generations from each breed, in a rat slum. Imagine, I mean, a, a rat cage is already kind of a slum, but, but imagine it much, much worse. Very little light. Uh, again, this is not, I'm glad that you're finding this funny, it's true. Uh, uh, very little light, no way to, uh, for these rats to exercise their brains or their minds in any way. They raised these two breeds in, in, it's, uh, in this uh, slum. And uh, then they ran the, the new generations through the mazes. And look what happened. The, I should say, look what happened. The, uh, <laughs> the, genetic, the, genetic, um, the genetic differences, the apparent genetic differences that had been around for many generations uh, between these two breeds basically disappeared. The rat Einsteins made just as many, just as many mistakes. Then they did the opposite. They tried the opposite environment. They uh, made what I call the Rat Four Seasons Maui, which is lots of light and lots of uh, patterns on the wall and every possible rat exercise machine you can imagine. And except for the freedom part, it was like a rat's paradise. And, and they raised new generations of each breed in that. And, and uh, they ran into the maze and almost the same result as the uh, as with the slums, the the environment all but dis the uh, the genetic differences all but disappear here. There is a slight difference, as you can see. The rat Einstein's made slightly few errors, but that was deemed statistically insignificant. So again, basically the message is this reliable genetic difference between these two breeds disappeared. How could that be? This really defied understanding in in the 1950s because that's not how they thought of genes. They, they had a certain way of thinking about genes, a certain model. Uh, we can call it the blueprint model. This is a, like this blueprint uh, uh, of the Eiffel Tower in that genes, and this is still the way that most people in the general public think about genes, genes have very specific information for what your traits are supposed to look like. Um, they have instructions that are right in, inside the gene that is this says that you're supposed to get a certain eye color. 
there's an instruction inside a certain gene or a set of genes that says what your height is supposed to be. There are instructions inside genes that say how athletic you're going to be and, or how musical and so on and so forth. The, the blueprint model. Well, what happened was over the ensuing decades, uh, a, new, a whole new understanding of genes came to be, and it's what I call the mixing board model. Um, it's not, it's the genes aren't, uh, don't have that finished, that information about what traits, finished traits are supposed to look like. Instead, genes do have instructions, but they're more like knobs and switches. They get turned on and off all the time. Scientists call it gene expression. So genes do have instructions, but how those instructions are carried out actually depends very much on other genes and also signals from the environment. So you can never say that a certain gene is going to absolutely produce uh, this certain outcome. Um, I shouldn't say never. Very, very rarely can you say that. It's really, and what we've come to understand in the last uh, 20 or 30 years is that really everything about genes is about gene expression. Or epigenetics is another way, another way to say that. So here's a way, here's a quote that sums up the current thinking of genes and, uh, and how traits uh, are, are, are developed. There are no genetic factors that can be studied independently of the environment, and there are no environmental factors that function independently of the genome. A trait emerges only from the interaction of gene and environment. That's from Michael Meany, who is, uh, take my word for it, a, a top geneticist today. He's at McGill University in Canada. Um, now, how does this work? What's going on with gene expression? Well, this is an image of an old model. I should be pointing like this. This is an image of an old model um, where DNA does have instructions, and those instructions are being passed through an RNA messenger and then taken outside the nucleus, and those instructions are used to assemble amino acids into a new protein. And that's all basically still true, but the new understanding of genes adds one very, very important wrinkle, and that is this hormone representing all sorts of environmental signals. Any, really, any signal at all in, inside uh, your body can, can talk to, can kind of interfere with the communication of the DNA and the RNA messenger. So yes, these instructions are coming down from the DNA, but how they're actually gonna get carried out into assembling amino acids into new proteins is actually going to be affected constantly by signals coming from the outside, both from other genes and from hormones and lots of other things. And of course, we all know that everything we do on the outside of our, our bodies, every thought we have, every food we eat, every activity uh, we, we make is gonna affect our body chemistry, so we are also affecting gene expression with, with everything we do. Now, uh, this story gets really interesting when you couple it with brain plasticity, which everyone's heard of. Not too many people have heard of gene expression, but everyone's heard of brain plasticity. The, the brain's famous ability to, uh, to, uh, to morph and, and, um, and change in response to environmental demands. I'm showing this picture of a London cab because in 1999, there was a neurologist named Eleanor McGuire who took brain scans of London cab drivers. And she did that because London cab drivers are famous for this extraordinary knowledge that they develop over the years. It's very, very difficult to learn how to navigate all of the London streets. They actually call it the knowledge, and you have to get tested on it after several years. And uh, so it's, it's a rather developed skill. And she wanted to see if she could see uh, differences in the brains of, of London cab drivers. So she did some MRIs, and she compared the cab driver's brains to non cabbie's brains. And in fact, she saw exactly what she was looking for. There's a part of the brain called the posterior hippocampus that actually uh, allows for our place memories. It's kind of our internal uh, map of, in our brains of, of how we understand the world outside of us. 